That way we can I'll share my screen with you and we will jump into what makes a good body paragraph. Let's see. I want pro. All right. So So you should all see my screen right now, uh, how to write a body paragraph. Um, and we're going to go through this. When we talk about body paragraphs, of course, this is where you're going to get most of your points. This is where you're going to get your supports, your describes, your analyzes. Uh, you're going to get your outside evidence here. So you're going to get up to four points in your body paragraphs. Um, and, you know, and of course, with the new rubric, it'll be even more than that. When we talk about what a body paragraph does, and a lot of you will be comfortable with this. But when we talk about what a body paragraph uh, does is it, it takes a piece of your thesis and it fully fleshes it out and proves it. All right. Very similar to like if you're writing a, a lab report or something, once you've put out your claim, once you put out your argument, you have to prove it with your facts. And in a DBQ, the facts are going to come from not only yourself, but also the documents that they've given you. OK. And so being able to use those documents and being able to prove your thesis is the whole point of these body paragraphs. So with any body paragraph, and I'm going to talk to you in a very kind of formulaic way, and of course you can do it in, in a variety of ways, but these are the elements that need to be in there. All right, you should have a topic sentence. This is your mini claim. This is the part of the thesis that you're going to prove in that paragraph. All right, so when you look at your thesis and you're like, okay, I'm going to prove this point first. All right, that's your, and then make that into a new claim, all right, about what the paragraph is about. And then Think about what documents you read that would support that little mini claim, would support that topic sentence. Okay. Then add in contextual facts to give, you know, relevancy and to give situation to those documents. And then make sure that you're explaining how the documents prove your topic sentence. All right. Finish it all off with another piece of information one that was not found in the documents that also proves your topic sentence and then transition to the next paragraph. If you can check off these uh, elements in any body paragraph, you're going to get your, your max points. All right. And that's really what we're trying to do here. So if I gave you a prompt about international events, fostering change in foreign policy between world war one and the Cuban missile crisis. So that's 1918 to 1963, uh, you know, First off, that's a huge, it's a huge one, right? But if you look at the body paragraph, you'll see that you're going to bring in these elements, right? So what's a what's something that fostered change in American foreign policy? So if you look at this example paragraph, all right. Well, after World War One, the U.S. pulled back from its internationalism. After World War Two, the U.S. became more active internationally due to the Cold War. So what caused change in American foreign policy was the Cold War, right? Building off concepts of American exceptionalism espoused by writers like Henry Luce. You may not know who that is, but if if we'd gone through it, you 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 would. Um, all of a sudden, now you're bringing in some context. You're bringing in some relevancy here. The U.S. sought to contain communism in order to... In order to contain communism, the National Security Council recommended that the U.S. build a military second to none. Now, you don't know what Document 5 is, but based on this, you can summarize that it is NSC 68, right? Now, you notice I didn't quote NSC 68. I didn't quote the document. There's no quotes in here at all. Instead, what I did was I summarized it, just completely summarized and paraphrased what the document was, all right? This policy, while never formally adopted by Congress, was implemented due to the active intervention of the United States in the Korean Civil War. So now I've given you some historical situation, and I've given you a little bit of, of complexity, that the NSC 68 was never formally adopted by Congress, right? But that situation is that the Korean Civil War allowed it to become the norm. After Eisenhower was elected president, he sought to increase America's interventionist foreign policy by expanding the Truman Doctrine of Containment to the Eisenhower Doctrine of Active Military Suppression of Communist Forces in an attempt to roll back communism. All right, so that's document six. Again, I've given you the historical situation, Truman Doctrine, Eisenhower Doctrine, uh, roll back, right? I've given you those, those facts that are giving you this, the context and the situation. Then I get into a little bit of the analysis and the argument here. This, Eisen, this Eisenhower Doctrine, though tough in rhetoric, failed to move Eisenhower to support anti-communists in Hungary because Hungary was in the Soviet sphere 
of influence established by the agreement at Yalta. And here we have, again, some complexity. Finally, the threat of nuclear war pushed the U.S. into active intervention. Again, you see how I'm supporting it, right? When we talk about what is the change in American foreign policy is that push into active intervention. Um, as both the U.S. and the Soviet Union developed bigger and more powerful military uh, nuclear missiles and standoffs, like the Cuban Missile Crisis threatened the, the destruction of the world, the U.S. actively negotiated with the Soviet Union to try to limit nuclear pr proliferation. So again, now we've given you historical situation and so forth. Another example of U.S. active intervention due to the Cold War, and here is my outside fact. So when you look at it, and I, I always start it with another example, right? Because that just highlights to the reader, that highlights to the reader, this is my outside fact. This is the one, this is the extra piece of information I'm bringing in to prove that I know more about this topic than just the documents. So another example of U.S. active intervention due to the Cold War would be the Marshall Plan and the Alliance for Progress. So here I've given you a couple pieces of outside information, both of which just sought, sought to increase American power and stop the threat of communism in Latin America, respectively. All right. So this document right here, this paragraph is a really good paragraph, and you may be sitting here going, I can't do that. That's okay. I think you can. I've used three documents. You know, with the new DBQ, you're only going to have five documents. So it's not like you can use three in a, in a paragraph. So if I'm thinking about it, I had a question about this I need to answer on the email, but um, if I'm thinking about it and I have five documents, then I have one paragraph with two documents, another paragraph with two documents, and then my outlier paragraph, my although paragraph with one document. Now, let's say you read the five documents and none of them really act as an outlier. I don't think that's going to happen, but let's just say it does. All right, so you have two, two, and one, or... Maybe there's no outlier, so you have a three, a two, and then you still want that outlier paragraph? Bring in your outside evidence there and put in some outside evidence in the outlier paragraph. Again, that's going to help you build uh, complexity because you are showing that you know more and that you understand the, the various histories that is happening, not just the singular history, right? Because that's really what complexity is about. When we talk about why College Board wants to see that, you know, it's not U.S. history. It's U.S. histories that there are so many different histories in the United States. And part of understanding that and part of showing that is is building that complexity in your in your uh, in your essay. All right, let's move on. Um, let's give you another prompt. This one is more from uh, uh, an earlier time period. Uh, still deals with foreign policy. Evaluate the extent to which domestic issues and foreign affairs foster change in American foreign policy. So if I got that prompt. All right. I'm highlighting some of the big things that I need to, to focus on. I need to focus on first that it's a change. That's a change uh, essay. So I, everything I do needs to talk about how it changed. How was it like before? And now what was it like after? Okay. That change. Um, and then I need to think about, okay, domestic issues and foreign affairs. So I, I have to address two very different aspects that might be causing change in foreign policy. All right. And so my context, what I'm going to be talking about, because if I look at my period, 1898 to 1920, the context of that period, the big picture is that this is the progressive era. Okay. I could also use the Spanish-American War, the War of 1898. And then if I'm really good, I might throw in some George Washington's farewell address to build that context into the essay to give the reader a sense of what it is that I'll be talking about in the essay. Then I throw my, my thesis down. All right, your complex thesis, although the people of the U.S. have maintained a level of isolationism through, throughout the period, the crucible of World War I fully changed U.S. government foreign policy from imperialism to isolationism. All right, so again, I'm addressing change, and I'm, I've explained to you how I'm going to show that change uh, throughout. So then I give you the example paragraph. All right, if my paragraph is about World War I, the crucible of World War I and its devastation forced American foreign policy to change from imperialism to isolationism as Americans rejected the internationalism and entanglements of the League of Nations. That's what I'm setting out to prove here. All right. I'm setting out to prove that World War I led to this change into more isolationism because of how Americans reacted to the League of Nations. All right. So imperialism brought the U.S. 
into World War I, a desire to protect American merchant ships from attack by Germans led Wilson to declare war on the Central Powers. This document is since six. Again, there is no quotes here. I'm s simply paraphrasing, and I also did not say, as seen in document six, or in document six, right? I'm not directly referring to the document in that way. I'm paraphrasing it. I'm giving you maybe author or title, right? But I'm definitely not um, sitting here and saying, as seen in document six, okay? And then as Americans sacrificed during the first total war of the 20th century, they rejected the idealism of Woodrow Wilson. Okay, so you can see these little points right here are going to be your historical situation. When Wilson negotiated peace in 1919, he compromised on his entire 14 points in favor of just one, the League of Nations. Opponents of the League of Nations perceived it as an attempt to entangle the U.S. in a permanent alliance with other nations of the world, supplanting U.S. sovereignty. So we have another document there. In 1920, the American voters selected Warren G. Harding, the isolationist candidate, in what Woodrow Wilson dubbed a solemn referendum in that historical situation of uh, the Treaty of Versailles. And I've, I've said this all, all year, and I'll keep repeating it. In U.S. history, if you know the history, DBQs are easy because you can always bring a historical situation to every document. When you read a document, you should know what is it referring to, okay? And if you know what it's referring to, the larger historical concept or idea that it's referring to, you can label it, and that gets you a historical situation. The U.S. Senate, led by Henry Cabot Lodge and the Re Reservations Republicans, rejected the treaty and set the U.S. on the course of isolationism throughout the 1920s and 30s. Another example, besides the rejection of the Treaty of Versailles, of the U.S. government becoming more isolationist would be the Red Scare of 1919, which Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer raided and deported suspected radicals. And then you have the Quota Act and the Fording Cumber Tariff. So I've given quite a bit of outside evidence as well. Again, this may seem daunting, but let's just look at an example from maybe a student. All right, one that's not written by Mr. Zuber. Okay, this is from last year's DBQ. This last year's DBQ was over the Progressive Era. All right, and it was about the success the, the Progressive Era had in uh, in reforms. Okay, and so here it starts out with due to the lack of business regulation, people began to uh, to get agitated by the lack of governmental protection which politically led to many reforms by the government, both federal and state. So the topic sentence is that we're looking at business reforms because people were upset by the lack of them. Okay. For instance, Teddy Roosevelt, under his square deal, advocated for trust busting, which he successfully performed. He busted major railroad trust. Okay. So that's all document two. You only have to put it in there once, but that's all document two. All right. And so here, this writer has given me a couple of things. I know the author of the document, so they brought up the author here, but they've also given me some historical situation. This is part of his square deal, right? And then they've summarized the document for me. It's talking about busting up major trust. Then you get into some of the more analysis. He believed in the concept of good and bad trust, which began the thought politically that trust can be detrimental to the general public. He hoped to reduce the corruption occurring in business, so did William Taft, who continued the legacy of, trust, of busting trust. Wilson went further and created the Clayton Antitrust Act, which helped labor unions rather than harm them like the Sherman Antitrust Act. So there you're bringing in some good complexity. The idea of the Clayton Antitrust Act being a direct response to the Sherman Antitrust Act. Okay. Then you go forward and you get the second document here. The enactment of the Wisconsin Plan in California by Governor Johnson also showed that political governments were becoming more democratic in their approach to passing bills and laws. This brings back Johnson's idea of for the common man. The government also increased involvement in business by get, beginning the side of labor unions by banning yellow dog contracts. This shows that governments during the progressive era became more liberal economically by providing aid to unions and busting businesses. So here, this is one that was written in the time period. Uh, it, you know, in the time limit set by a college board, by a student, and it's not perfect. You know, if I was sitting here, we could pick it apart. But do they successfully argue that the progressive era had success in regulating business? Yes. They have two documents. Maybe the do this document four is not the best document to put there, right? But they have a lot of outside evidence, especially right here. 
You can see that kind of use of outside evidence right here. The government also increased involvement in business by beginning to side with labor unions by banning yellow dog contracts. All right, that's a that's a good piece of outside evidence. And overall, they're they're showing this kind of success on the part of the progressives to um, regulate business. All right. So those are the examples I have. Again, going back to our first slide, when we talk about what's in a body paragraph. Make sure that you have your little checklist there that you started off. You know, some of you like to start off right in the middle of your of your thought, but you got to start it off with a topic sentence. Like, get us in there. What what is it that you're going to prove in this paragraph? And then pick your documents. You don't want to have a paragraph of four or five documents, especially if you only have four or five. All right, you want to have a paragraph that has two at the max three. But you could have as little as one, right, or zero if, if for some reason. Uh, there's no document that supports maybe an outlier. But for the most part, you're probably going to have docu uh, paragraphs that have about two documents per paragraph. Okay. Then think about the facts that surround that those documents. All right. Don't be afraid to, um, to bring in those outside facts. And what's going to be great about the, the test you're going to take is that you're going to, you're going to have open book. So it's going to be one of those things where if I were you, I would have, four stacks in front of me. I have to have a period three stack, a period four, a period five, a period six, and a period seven, sorry, five stacks. Because those are the five periods that it can come from. And as soon as you read the topic and know what period it is, get rid of everything else, pull that one stack. That way you can do some quick referencing into that. All right. So make some notebooks with some notes in them and stuff like that. Okay. And have those notes readily available. Do not rely on them though, because you only have 45 minutes and you don't want to spend 10 minutes looking something up and lose all that time. So bring in those outside facts. As far as historical, um, as far as historical um, context or historical situation, you only need one per document, but then you need one real good piece of outside evidence at the very end. Okay. And then make sure that you end it with a piece of extra information. If you could have other documents, if you could have other uh, facts to support it, what would those be? And then transition into the next paragraph. Okay. All right. So we have about 10 minutes left. I'll open it up to questions. I'll go ahead and, uh, oops, my video. Um, I'll go ahead and open up to questions if you have any. Uh, otherwise, I want to see what you can write, uh, turn it in this week, and I'll get you some feedback on those. So the AP test is only a DBQ? Yes, yeah, one DBQ, 45 minutes, five documents. There's a whole video about it there, Jeremiah, on YouTube. Mr. Zuber? Uh-huh. So um, for a historical situation, whenever I'm a, attempting to get that point, I always think that I'm um, being clear enough. Yeah. But... Um, Usually it doesn't um, come out that way. Right. So um, if you have any spare, I mean, do you have any spare documents with you? Do you think we could um, practice um, writing or, or embedding your historical situation point into um, your summarization of the document? Do you want me to pull up a document right now? Is that what you're wanting? Yeah. Like, Leah? Where'd you go? Yeah. Did you want me to pull one up right now? Hmm. Are you saying yes? Is that, am I hearing a yes here? Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Let me pull up the document here. Um, and then we will figure out what the historical situation is. Um, let's see here. <laughs> I did not have these documents pulled up. All right, any other questions while I'm pulling up a document here? Do we have to have three body paragraphs? No. No, um, three makes it better. Three makes more complexity, uh, but you can do two, right? So you could do uh, so, you know, if you have five documents, three and one, two and another, fine. Ah, come on, why is this not open? Okay. 
All right, what else? Okay, so here I am trying to get... Uh, cool. So no, Leah, apparently I cannot pull up a <laughs> document right now because my computer is not loading anything. That's fine. I'll just email you. Now, hold on. I, I'm going to get this to work. Why, why would Google Drive stop working right now? That doesn't make any sense to me. Well, we can pull up. Let's pull up the... You could go pull up the DBQ that you're going to be working on this week to to uh, to build your. Um... Oh my God, I hate technology sometimes. But pull that one up to pull to uh, to build your um, body paragraph, and I'll go ahead and pull that one up, and we can just look at some of those documents and see what kind of historical situation we might get out of that. Okay, nope. It's not all right, so Leah, do you have the doc, the DBQ from this week pulled up? Yes. All right. I also will, will have that here in one second. Do, do, do. There is period seven women. All right. Yeah, like, um, pull for document C. Mm hmm. Um, so I know that she was mainly responsible for whole houses. Okay. So yeah, so that would be a good piece of information about who she is, right? That she is Jane Adams, who was a leader in the settlement house movement, right? Right. Makes sense. Um, then when you're looking at this, what is she talking about? Um, just the just the title, Why Women Should Vote. Well, yeah. Yeah. All right. So we could you could bring a historical situation as in the fight for the 19th Amendment, right? That's a piece of historical uh, situation. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to go down and you started looking at, say, like the last paragraph of that document, if women would fulfill her traditional responsibility to her own children, that she would educate and protect from danger, factory uh, children who must find their recreation on the street. If she would bring the cultural forces to bear upon materialistic civilization, if she would do it all with dignity and directness, fitting one who carries on her immemorial duties, then she must bring herself to use to to the use of the ballot. All right, and so this really directs us to thinking about that concept in um in the Gilded Age and Progressive Era in which women were using the cult of domesticity and this expanding sphere uh, from uh, domesticity to maternalism, right? Saying that, hey, we're responsible for taking care of all of these um, different aspects. And if we are going to do that, we have to vote it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that would be kind of one of the directions I would go, right? That using you know, couching her rhetoric in the in the in the terms of domesticity and maternalism, right? Boom! Now I've got a historical situation. Um, Jane Adams argues that women uh, deserve the right to vote, which will eventually lead to the Nineteenth Amendment. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just with that sentence, you could get the point. What was that? Just with that sentence, you could get the point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By just using the Nineteenth Amendment. Well, I mean, it has to be part of part of your argument, but yeah, definitely. Like, if you okay. bring what they're looking for, is they're looking for you to be able to do more than just read the documents. Can you read the documents and understand where and when and why the document was created? So, when I read document C, just thinking about it, I was like, okay, she's she's talking about much bigger ideas than just this one document. She's talking about these societal issues of uh, women's role in the in the emerging cities and this concept of maternalism in which women used the idea that they're responsible for taking care of the kids to um, push for the right to vote, right? And so that all kind of comes right out in that, especially that last paragraph. So that's how I would, I would frame it, saying that this is um, an example of women pushing for the right to vote due to these social and cultural ideas. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh.
What else? Anything else? All right. I will post this on uh, YouTube and on Canvas. Um, if you have any questions as you go through the document, uh, the DBQ that I gave you uh, as you're writing your paragraphs, please email me or jump on WebEx. I will also be on WebEx on Thursday. Uh, I'll have an open uh, classroom so you can come in and just ask questions. Okay. And if you have already written a paragraph and you want to go ahead and give that to me and then we can talk about face to face on Thursday, that'd be great. All right. I hope you all have a great day and I will see you all on Thursday. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.